and is not dependent. They feel that a woman is equally competent just like a man. Others like Kamala Markandeya, Shashi Despande, and the Toru Dattu, Meha, uh, Mahashweta Devi, all these writers have focused on the problems and issues faced by the women in today's male-dominated world as a main theme of their books. For instance, some of the novels of Ante Desai like Cry the Peacock, Fire on the Mountain, uh, Where Shall We Go This Summer, she has portrayed the complexities between a man and a woman relationship. She has tried to explore the psychological aspects of the lead protagonist. The woman novelist tried to create awareness that this is a time to proclaim with a definite precision. Overall, Anta Desai is a well-known uh, woman writer and the utmost thought-provoking creative novelist in the realm of Indian fiction in English. She has added a new significant dimension to the fiction and the, to the portrayal of suffering of women. The novels of Anta Desai are basically female-oriented. Uh, she probes into their problem, be it of a daughter, sister, or a mother, or grandmother, or a wife. Her female figures appear as a victim in patriarchal or a male chauvinistic society. And overall, she designs the exploration of disturbed psyche of Indian women lying emphasized on the factors of lack of self-identity, loneliness, and alienation. These three things which mass, uh, matters most in Anta Desai novels, Cry the Peacock, Fire on the Mountain, and Where Shall We Go This Summer, her truthful portrayal of women characters who are seen suffering from these sense of existential problems and patience. In her debut novel, overall, these three novels dealt with, and I have taken these three novels only to expose that the oh, Anita Desai has brought and she has exposes the suffering, silent suffering of women in the society through her novels. And it is not a solution that she has given, but she brought some awareness in the society that there are the people, the women are suffering in the society like this. Overall, in her debut novel, Cry the Peacock, as we know, the peacock means it, it dances when the thunders uh, sounds and all these things. But the peacock is crying even though we, there is a atmosphere and because of male chauvinistic society. And here, the patience of a man and a woman is totally different from overall we know that. And Maya and the Gautam are the main important characters in this uh, novel. And uh, Maya, what we, she is emotionally, she needs some desires of physical desires and mental desires and she wants to be loved with her husband, whereas Gautam is totally different and he's elder than a, a Maya and he wants a, as a philosophical man and he deals the life as a materialistic and doesn't bother about the emotions of Gautam, of Maya. This is a contrary and there is a lot of gap between these two persons and they live in a loveless marriage of case. Overall, in the cry the peacock, the uh, portrayal of uh, Anita Desai is the Maya's life does reveal that a uh, subtle pattern of protagonist's journey from a stale expectations to that of a disappointment. Finally, this disappointment her, takes her life to the final disaster. Thus, Anta has given a picturesque struggle of Maya who loves her husband and wants to be loved within in the same way. And she desires to get her wishes to be considered by the Gautam, but she fails in all and fails and meets a pathetic end. This is a one part of a woman who struggles, who wants to get a love from her husband. And another part is, uh, I have taken another novel for the best example, that is A Fire on the Mountain. Uh, it is a, a, a title taken from the Lord of Files that was written by William Golings. As you know, that in the second chapter, it was, uh, and uh, here the title itself symbolical meaning and highly significant from thematic point of view. In this novel, Anita Desai portrays a loneliness, isolation, and agony in the life of Nanda Kaur. Here we can see the two important character, uh, characters, that is Nanda Gaul and Raka, and another one is also Ila Das. When we uh, a little bit neglect that Ila Das, there are the two important characters, that is Nanda Kaul and the Raka. Both have separated both have uh, developed uh, uh, awareness and, uh, and she too have some desires. And so 
and her children also after using that they move away from that and they doesn't care about another call and being that that's the deceived and betrayed by her husband and children she is a forsake woman and nanda calls grand daughter that is rakka she has developed such a type of isolation because of traumatic experiences she has come across in her childhood mother's ill health and excessive drinking and aggressive behavior of her father turn against all the human connections so that is the main important thing and uh, the we can see in one perspective that either the married woman or a girl child they are being a party the treatment in this male chauvinistic society and both nanda kaul and raka are branded crazy ones and both are equally lonely outcast nanda kaul feeding on image post grandeur and raka recovering from a typhoid and battered home a life entitled new women in mulkraj anand's novels a note mulkraj anand has played key roles to enrich various forms of art art and aesthetics he has received high academic qualifications from the institutions of abroad written poems novels short stories reviews and lectured across the world he has encouraged fine arts like dance and painting his role as an indian novelist in english is the most distinct of all it's very significant to note that he has written his novels with a lofty aim of a social cause or a social reform his chief concern is woven around two sections of society which are the most disabled namely downtrodden and women in indian society anand has witnessed the plight of all sections of women closely and felt sympathy for them deeply his sympathies for women are expressed in two forms firstly he exposes how women are subjugated subordinated and exploited either in the name of caste and class externally in the society and in the name of gender internally within the household or community this is observed in the episodes of sogini in untouchable leela in two leaves and one bud iqbal in the lament on the death of master of arts Devaki in and Mrs Kaur in autobiographical novels the characters are shown above except their subjugated status and endure the hardships weeping silently secondly he visualizes the emancipation of a woman this vision is observed in the episodes of gauri in gauri janki in the big hot and maharani indira in the private life of indian prince these characters also exhibit endurance towards the male chauvinism but to a certain limit only when the humiliation becomes too unbearable they do not fail to revolt and assert their sense of independence thus they emerge as a new women an attempt is made to evince how jonki in the big hot and maharani indira in the private life of indian prince qualify themselves to be regarded as a new woman in this paper john key as a new woman in the big hot the big hot narrates the story of ananda who is an embodiment of generosity jess for life and high spirits he launches a crusade against such negative forces as a narrowness obscurantism defeatism and fatalism of a tradition there arises a conflict between the capitalist and the native copper smiths who were establishing a factory in the locality of the later he endeavors to bridge the wide gulf between the two groups peacefully for his ideal is that the machine should be exploited fruitfully for the happiness of all his efforts are defeated by the political opportunists and they murder him through raila who attacks him however his beloved jonki takes up the incomplete task and tries to accomplish anand's anandas mission with a pure and lofty heart jonki is the chief woman character in the big hot though she is introduced and anandas mistress in the beginning of the novel ananda treats her as a wife only she is a widow before anand has accepted accepted her she has been married off to a woman a man older than herself whose death has left her in a lurch ananda finds her near a temple 
and rescues her from the grip of a destitution. Her status as a widow is revealed when Ananda recollects his first meeting her. Janki is down with a fever now and has been suffering from tuberculosis for lost many years. Ananda pays a visit to her at her residence and remembers that he has met her earlier. At this juncture, it's revealed that Janki, Janki is a widow. Ananda's recollection is shown as follows, I quote, he felt a faint nausea in the stomach with a fear that her temperature may have risen long before he had met her at the Shirun of sages in the village of Kanovan in Kurdaspur district. She had been consumed by the insidious tuberculosis. He did not know when the disease had begun to eat her into, eat, eat into her whether before the death of her husband or afterwards, I unquote. The author has paint, painted an innovative portrait of a Janki as a widow. He presents two different dimensions of a Janki. He exhibits a widow's predicament on one hand and glorifies her by depicting her as an optimist. It is reflected in her firm decision to accept Ananda as her second husband. Good morning, one and all. And, uh to thanks to the organizers for giving me the occasion to present my paper. And thank you, Shibhukta Shahin, once again. I'm not a very strong person in Indian writing in English, and much less in non-native literatures, as the title of the seminar goes. But then, of late, my interest in Indian literature, particularly translated works in the native uh, regional languages of literature, has also been uh, um, interested, uh, aroused by a number of translations that has been taken up by my senior colleagues at the place I work. So this morning I'm going to talk about a very, very short story written by C.S. Ambai, C.S. Lakshmi, who writes under the pen name Ambai. Her story is titled as Yellow Fish. It's a very, very brief story, as you can see. It's as short as possible, so I assure you my paper is also going to be quite short. Title as Yellow Fish. Um, before I go into the, uh, the story and some of my impressions of the story, I just want to introduce to you C.S. Lakshmi is born in Tamil Nadu. She's a distinguished fiction writer in her Tamil. Her works are characterized by her passionate espousal of the cause of women. Uh, her works are characterized by her passionate espousal of the cause of women, a lucid and profound style, and a touch of realism. It's interesting to note she is one of the most important Tamil writers today, and she is the only Tamil writer to have been included in the recently published Picada Book of Modern Indian Literature, edited by Amit Chaudhary. Most of our stories are about relationships and they contain brilliant observations about contemporary life. She also talks about exploration of space, silence, coming to terms with many things in life, and the importance of communication, which are some of the recurring themes in her works. Now this story, and uh, she's also associated with, uh, sh she's uh, presently working as a director of sound and picture archives for research of women that is called Sparrow in Mumbai. She's a recipient of Narayan Swami Iyer Prize for her fiction. She's written a number of books, particularly in Tamil and a few in English too, but most of them are available as translated versions. Now this story, titled Yellow Fish, is set in Maharashtra on a sea coast. It is a very brief story about a yellow fish it begins with an omniscient narrator who is watching the fishermen return from their fishing expedition. As the fishermen return with their prey and sort out their fish into categories and sizes to be sold to the retail people, and while sorting, the fishermen throw away the, the unwanted fish, which nobody would like to purchase. The yellow fish, as the title goes, is one such fish that is thrown away on the sand. Later, the story ends with the yellow fish that is mercifully enabled to go back to the sea and merge into it. The story contains another story within it in a nutshell. 
As the narrator continues to watch the yellow fish shuddering and leaping in the hot sand, on the hot sand, the fish gasps and closes its mouth, shudders and tosses once again. At this point, the omniscient narrator is surreptitiously replaced by the first person. The mouth of the fish closing and opening, gasping for water and desperate for life, reminds her, obviously, of her infant daughter. Just as the omniscient narrator fades away, the story gets a personal bearing with her reflections of her infant daughter named Jalaja. One presumes that her daughter Jalaja is a premature baby because the writer says that Jalaja was too hasty and she pushed and bumped her way out into the world. As the story reveals, despite efforts to save her by putting her in an incubator, apparently the infant did not survive. The author is, remembers the baby's pale red mouth, her round eyes and the movement of her mouth as if sucking. The story suddenly takes us to the scene of her husband, Arun, returning with an urn from the crematorium. The small urn obviously contains the ashes of the infant, Jalaja. If you look at some of the aspects of a short story, the conflict in this short story arises and it is between man and man, that is man and the woman. Because when Anu, the mother or the wife, wants the husband Arun to open the mouth of the urn, which was tied with a piece of cloth, the husband is reluctant. But however reluctant, he removes the cloth to reveal the urn's tiny mouth and seeing the ashes, which are almost lost in that small urn, Anu breaks down. At this point again, it's interesting to note that the omniscient narrator comes into picture to comment and relate the ashes and the sea once again. The urn is like a sea. Quote, the ashes were in this very sea. As the sea and the urn